I've invited Dr. and Professor Emily Levine um, to give an introduction to the Haftarah. Um, and she is right here. She was downstairs getting uh, her husband Matthew and her son Jasper um, and, uh, and juggling the many roles of being a, uh, not only a professor of history um, at Stanford University, um, but also a mom and also a wife. And um, it is those many roles that she will speak about today. Um, the talk, the, the, the uh, title of her talk, The Three Khanas. The Three Khanas. Yeah. Rabbi Graber, thank you for waiting for me <laughs> uh, to begin. Hannah Arendt was born in 1906 to a distinguished Jewish family from Königsberg. She read Kant by 14 and founded a circle devoted to ancient Greek literature. As an established scholar, she achieved renown for her analysis of totalitarianism and courted controversy for her affair with the sometime Nazi Martin Heidegger and her coverage of the Eichmann trial. Rabbi Graeber asked me to introduce this morning's Haftorah, which tells the story of the biblical Chana. So why do I begin my commentary with a German Jewish philosopher dead over 40 years? I was trained in the field of German intellectual history, and for many years that Chana was my guiding light for navigating the core texts of the European tradition. But Arendt reached the pantheon of great thinkers, one could say, despite her Jewishness and womanhood. In The Human Condition, written in exile from Nazi Germany, Arendt wrote of the necessity of overcoming the private, which included female biology, to make a name for oneself. Hannah Arendt is the first of three Hannahs I'll speak about this morning who have been crucial to my identities as a scholar, a Jew, and a mother, and I'll share some thoughts about my journey to explore the endless possibilities of these roles and the humility in accepting their limitations. Arendt's critique, rooted in the ancient tradition, resonates in my reading of the second Chana, the biblical Chana today. That Chana, we are told twice, is barren, for, quote, the Lord had closed her womb, much like Sarai, whom Rabbi Graber told us about earlier. The story from Samuel emphasizes the importance of childbirth by opening with a long lineage. And in that context, infertility meant obsolescence, that you served no purpose, that you didn't matter. It was a condition not assuaged by the love of Elkanah, her sweet husband, nor by the double portion that he gave her from the sacrifice. One imagines it only made her feel worse. Hannah's shame was magnified by her rival Panina, Elkanah's second wife, who taunted her mercilessly. It was not enough to feel the anguish that she couldn't participate in the story of her people, but she had to be reminded of that whenever they went on the annual pilgrimage to the temple or whenever she saw Panina hosting gender reveal parties or posting filtered pictures of her babies on Instagram, for example. Uh, we're still talking about Hannah and Panina, of course. Facing her limitations and contributing either biologically or as a leader herself, Hannah does the only thing available to her. She prays. And boy, does she pray. The Midras offers an endless array of commentary on the nature of her prayer. In one account, she appeals to her need to fulfill her biological purpose. She says, quote, you did not create anything for naught. These breasts that you placed on my heart, what for? Give me a son and I will nurse them. In another, we see a hint of her ambition asking or even prophesizing for a prominent baby boy or Zera Anashim, literally the seed of men. Hannah so pines for a child that she bargains with God for help getting pregnant 
in exchange for committing her unborn child to the priesthood. And so moving is her prayer that we are told that the Lord remembers her. And she calls him Samuel, quote, because I have asked him of the Lord. By birthing a future prophet, she becomes a handmaiden to God and to her people. Biblical Hannah recedes from the story after giving birth to Samuel in one way confirming Arendt's critique of a society in which women contribute only through reproduction. Today, women can be part of the public realm without giving birth to prophets or warriors or kings. Of course, there is more work to be done, but the public realm has expanded to include more women. Yet despite the gain, these gains a women have made, contributing biologically is still seen as a Jewish woman's moral responsibility to her people. The problem is that having children is not available for everyone, as it wasn't for me for many years. Hannah's lament was my way into the world of prayer. Previously self-conscious, about my prayer, my Hebrew wasn't good enough, I didn't daven fast enough. Never have I felt closer to prayer than when I stood before the ark in this synagogue, there, <laughs> on Yom Kippur five years ago and prayed for strength and assistance in having a child. After years of challenges, we named our daughter Hanaleah in Hebrew, my third Hana, in part because of the resonance of this experience. But a baby isn't at the end of every prayer for a child. And if the divine is that which is outside of our control, the image of God as the opener and closer of wombs should bring us all, women and men, closer to Rosh Hashanah's themes of acceptance and humility. That infertility stands in for that universal theme can either be a painful reminder of falling short or an opportunity for greater inclusivity. When I was single or struggling to have a child, synagogues were not as comforting places as they should have been. I identified with Hannah Arendt who wanted to be recognized for contributions beyond the biological. And I empathized with biblical Hannah, who was not welcomed into the temple. She was accused of being drunk and was ashamed by her rival, Penina. In one way, the biblical Hannah has the last word. She transcended the particularity of her womanhood and is credited for becoming the model and source of all Jewish prayer, men or women, including that we pray standing, that we pray from our hearts, and that we pray with silent words. We honor Hannah on Rosh Hashanah, and each time we pray, our lips moving inaudibly to all but the creator of all life. But our prayer is quite literally interrupted by the blast of the shofar, which the scholar of Eva Zornberg has suggested recall, recalls the cry of a woman who wants but cannot have a child. Today, I'm truly blessed to fulfill my professional dream as a scholar and to have two children, my beloved Jasper Hirsch and our new daughter, Florence Lilly Hanalea as well as the love of my devoted Elkanah, Matthew. May this year be a year of embracing our human limitations with the dignity of the biblical Hannah, striving for the greatness of Hannah Arendt, and a hope for a future with the pure potential of baby Hannah Leah. And may the shofar this year help us recognize the many Hannahs all around us and all that they contribute to our communities. Thank you. We say yashikoach to Emily for her beautiful words, for her heart and mind and soul. We're going to call forward Randy Smith.